before the internet, one platform was king, and that was the magazine. They have pages filled to catch your eye, like tools, inventions, and things to buy. They would always educate, entertain, and inspire. All you needed to do was submit your subscription flyer. I have stacks and stacks of all this history, so let's open one up and uncover the mystery. Let's take a look at Popular Mechanics, November 1957. See what it has in store for us today. Submachine guns, 1795. Is that real? Can you? Is that a real machine gun? Delivered to your door. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Oh, that's so funny. Everything new for 1958. Appraisal of the new models. Oh man, can you imagine going to the dealer, 1958, to get a Corvette? Sign me up. I always thought those Imperials were cool. Wall TV set, 16 inches deep. <laughs> that must have been a big one. 16 inch TV, <laughs> the, the big screen. Shoot, I think iPads are about that big now. Electric car, has $12 motor. Look at that little motor and that little car. <laughs> That's funny. Only if they knew now what Tesla's had in them. Oh, Walt Disney's Mechanical Wonderland. Oh yeah, there's the hippo at Disneyland. Oh, I see how it comes out of the water. Pretty simple. If I was much younger, I think I would apply for that job. I think you'd see a lot of fun stuff, learn a lot of interesting things, and meet a lot of talented people to make the machines and design the machines and maintain the machines. Hair size hole made by drill operating at frequencies of 28,000 cycles per second. A tiny brass drill bit tipped with diamond paste can bore a hole about the diameter of a human hair. Oh, that little tiny thing. Look, it's a, it's a little tiny arrow. You probably can't see that. Oh, so there's a match tip and then the holes next to it. Hmm. Mechanical aids for the doctor. <laughs> that equipment. It's, you know what? When you still go to the doctor's office, it still kind of looks like that. Nobody knows what any of that stuff does. <laughs> Look at that lamp, a modern TV lamp. That one's kind of neat looking. That would be a fun weekend project to recreate that one. I don't know, it's kind of space agey, spacey. Ooh, air drive outboard motor powers ice fishing sled. Now we're talking. That looks fun to build. <gasps> and there's plans. Mm. See, I know I'm in the right place when there's a shaper in the photo. And a horizontal milling machine. I'm like right at home. Well, they got chucking a threaded rod. When chucking a threaded end of a rod, you can avoid damage to the threads by simply wrapping the length of wire, oh, wrapping wire around the threads before putting it in the chuck. That's a good tip. I'll have to remember that one. The Marlin 336 carbine. This one puts the meat in the freezer. <laughs> So to give you guys an update, I have not heard anything about my jet engine plans, unfortunately. I want to see if I can get plans for something. Mechanical pencil calculator? What? Pencil calculator gives answers, not a slide ruler for $2.25. So I'm gonna throw some money into an envelope and see if I can get a mechanical pencil calculator back from 1958. Maybe I get lucky, maybe not. Maybe I'll get a cool letter back, who knows but I'm gonna try it, see what happens. Well, this is interesting. Looks like Mr. Logan's from Florida. He has a carnival shop. Looks like he makes woodworking things, totem poles. He's an artist. He makes signs. He's even converted his bandsaw to left-hand operation. This is a really interesting gentleman. I bet you if he was around today, he would have a YouTube channel. This vice says, made by Logan, holds a horse carving. That's a pretty interesting construction. It's kind of similar to my big floor vise, but a little bit lighter duty. I've never seen a vise with this type of construction, and I think I would like to try to make it. I've never built anything like this, so I think we should go for it. Let's build Mr. Logan's vise. Before we get started, I have some concerns with Mr. Logan's vise design. The first being that it looks like the dynamic jaw is a little weak and could bend. The second is it looks like the center of gravity is off, so when you put something large in the jaws, it could tip over. And the third being, I wonder how strong this whole design is in general. So we're going to put it on the test probe and see how much force it can generate. So the first problem I have to solve is that in the Popular Mechanics magazine, I have no dimensions, no plans, no nothing to build Mr. Logan's vise. So to get the drawing started, I need to find an object in the photo to pull scale from. I thought about using Mr. Logan's hat, his cigar, or even his hammer, but all of these things vary in size, so that's not a good idea. 
The one thing that Mr. Logan and I share is that we both have arms. So I hope Mr. Logan doesn't mind that I borrow his. I'm gonna be using Logan's wrist to elbow distance. And when I measured my arm, I came up with a distance of 11 inches. It may not be perfect, but it's gonna get me close. The vise then sits approximately three arms tall and about two arms wide. This is gonna give me the good starting point to make the CAD model. And this is what I came up with. It may not be exact, but it looks pretty dang close. I'd like to try and recreate Mr. Logan's vise exactly as it has in the photo without making any changes first. Once we see if this design works or doesn't work, we can make changes to the model and then I'll make the plans available to you guys on the Fireball Tool website. So it looks like Logan used eight inch channel iron, some two by two angle iron, some heavy duty plate steel, and a wide flange or I-beam. So this is gonna be fun, so let's get started welding the mainframe of the vise. I called out for the mainframe to be made out of eight inch C-channel, and this weighs 13 pounds per foot. Miter cut on both ends for that classy seamless joint look. So this C-channel is the base of the vise. This structural member here is the main support column, and I'm gonna get these suckers welded at a 90 degree angle. I can choose to do this vertically, or I can do it on its side. I think I'm gonna try doing it on its side. It's gonna be much more accurate that way. The problem with C-channel is that it's never perfect. What I mean by that is this leg is not parallel to the bottom. If you picture a staple, the two legs can be bowed in or out. So by laying it on its side, I can obviously tell that it's leaning to one direction. So I'm gonna be using the mega square here and holding it from the outside of the corner. It's gonna take care of the squareness and the roll of each component at the same time. So I'm using a dual shield flux core wire to weld this together. It's basically a hard wire with some flux inside of it, and then it uses a argon gas to help shield it. This is a structural welding process. It burns hot, it gets great penetration, and it's fast. But if you're going to try something like this, you're gonna to wanna to get yourself some good gloves because the heat that radiates off this weld is crazy. I could not explain to you how hot it is. So get yourself a good set of gloves, preferably something like this gauntlet to protect yourself if you wanna try a welding like this. Now that the channel is welded at 90 degrees, it's time to keep them there. So we need to add a support. And I'd like this flat plate to be touching this flat plate. So I'm gonna have to do some fancy notching with the cutting torch to get it all to fit nice and neat. Now judging from the photo, he has it set about six inches from the back and it looks like about 10 inches from the top. I don't really care what the angle is because you can use a piece of plywood, cardboard, or even another piece of metal. Get your targets set up on your metal frame, both top and bottom, where you want the gusset to go, and then just mark out with a pencil what the angle is. And now you have a template which you can cut out and transfer to your metal. And that way you know your piece is gonna fit perfect and you really don't care what angle it is. It's a nice way to solve the problem if you don't have CAD. I'm using this silver streak pencil. The torch doesn't melt it away and you can really see what you're doing. Mark's all silver streak welder's pencil. Since I have the torch out to do all the coping, I decided to cut the hole for the I-beam or wide flange to slip through. This location was determined by my CAD model. So this is by far the hardest component of this whole assembly. You can probably do this with a skinny wheel. I don't recommend it. The torch or plasma cutter is gonna be your best bet. Got everything all welded out, it's looking great. Got the hole cut for the I-beam. Now I need to transfer this hole to this front face so that dynamic jaw can slide through. The second hole for the wide flange beam is the most critical. It determines the direction of the beam. Think of these two holes like gun sights on a rifle. If the hole is put in the wrong location, it could cause the slide to go up, down, left, or right. That could hurt me later when I go to install the screw assembly. So all I'm gonna do is just use a combination square and transfer these lines around to the front and that's gonna get me pretty close. So no need to be exact with this. We will adjust that later. I'm cutting the hole oversized about a quarter of an inch. This is gonna allow me to get the alignment of the beam perfect a little bit later on. If you cut the hole too tight and get the tolerances too close together, you're probably gonna fight getting that I-beam to slide through. This turned out pretty good, but it's pretty hot. So while it's cooling down, let's work on the dynamic jaw part of the vise. I'm gonna be repurposing a W6 by 15 wide flange beam. That's six inches tall and weighs 15 pounds per foot. 
Another reason why you guys should make these holes bigger than necessary is because, well, if you take a look at this I-beam or W-beam, let's measure flange to flange. And it comes out as five and seven eighths of an inch. This is supposed to be a six inch beam. If we go to the other side, it's six and an eighth. So our I-beam is squished or our two flanges are not parallel with each other. And that's totally fine, that's acceptable. That's just what I-beams are. But we need to be building accordingly to the material and don't assume that this is perfect. So that's why all the clearances are loose and we'll adjust for those right now. So in Mr. Logan's design, I can see a piece of angle iron acting like a little table or shelf on the bottom. So we're gonna put that in next. So I'm building supports all the way around this I-beam. The back, I'm gonna match the angle with this piece of plate. We're gonna stick it in the press, basically capture this I-beam. Not too tight, but just right. So the back part of the jaw is probably one of the most critical areas. This is gonna wanna be lifting up when you clamp. So I'm thinking I'm gonna use a piece of round rod. I cannot see in the picture what this looks like. So I'm going to assume that he did something like this. So I'm gonna weld this piece of round stock Hopefully that'll help that slide when it's under pressure. <laughs> this is exactly the way I thought this thing would sound. <laughs> So I have a bottom shelf for the I-beam to slide on. Mr. Logan in his photograph has the top piece of angle iron like this. Is that for a reason? Maybe. My first indication were to put it like this. He has a reason he put it like this. I wanna follow his drawing as closely as possible, so I'm probably gonna put it like this. Well, I'm gonna do the same thing right here. I cannot see any indication how he solves this problem, but I'm going to assume it's probably the same way. So let's get those pieces cut and installed. Check out these fireball clamps. As you can see, it has a really long reach on one side and a short reach on the other. When comparing to a standard clamp, they're both equal on both sides, which could be a problem. If you're trying to clamp inside a tight area like this, can't get in there. So the fireball gives you that option, short or long. And in this situation, it's perfect because I can reach over the deep flange and reach in to the small hole. That's about as best as you're gonna get with a warped I-beam. It's now time to get the dynamic jaw welded to that wide flange. I'm using another piece of eight inch channel iron and setting up some stops and some magnetic one, two, three blocks to get the alignment perfect with the static jaw that has already been welded. Once that's in place, I basically just tacked everything together to make sure it runs smooth. So it's now time to get the jaws welded to the static jaw and the dynamic jaw. And it looks like Mr. Logan just used a piece of that eight inch channel iron. By his picture, it looks like he has the sticking out a little bit, but not all the way. So what we're gonna have to do is make a cope in here to slip over the existing. So we're gonna slot that, weld it on. And we might make some nice 45, something fancy. That's what the picture looks like anyway. So let's replicate that. I'm looking to match both jaws together, so I've clamped them. That way I can mirror all the features and make them look identical. This is my favorite part about metalworking, is sculpting something so it looks good to your eye. Nothing can really be wrong here. As long as it looks good, it's right. Probably wondering what I'm using. My new scraper. This is for welding tables, chipping hammer. It removes BBs, slag, spatter, and the design is pretty simple. It's got a stainless steel weighted handle. It's got a tool steel cutting edge. This also clears out the holes or the chamfer inside the welding table. It's a nozzle cleaner. You can use it forward or backwards. It's got a replaceable blade on it, and it works really dang good. It's now time to add some structural plate steel to strengthen this dynamic jaw. It looks like in the photo there's a stiffener plate or a back plate to basically turn this channel into a piece of tubing. So I really don't know why we just didn't use a piece of tube to begin with, but we're just following the photo. So let's get this plate on, weld it in place, and then we can work on the screw. So let's get that done. It looks like Mr. Logan placed this plate steel inside the legs of the channel. So that requires cutting down some plate steel to get a custom size and then putting a nice break shape on the end to give the curvature of the top jaw. It also needed a cope to get it to fit just right. I plan on coming back and stitching this on permanently and not do any solid welds because that could warp the whole assembly. So stitch welding and tacking. Mr. Logan's vise has this two by two piece of angle iron welded to the front of the vise to keep it from tipping over. And he has these really big radiuses that you could see in the picture that are cut out. So what's the fastest way to remove all this material? 
Well, I think we're gonna use the go-kart grinder to do that. And I'd like to see how fast I can hog away this quarter inch thick piece of material on the corner here. So let's time it and see how fast we can do it. Three, two, one, 100 miles per hour, here we go. I'm using a ceramic 40 grit belt at a surface feet per minute of 9,000, or pretty close to 103 miles per hour. If you'd like to know more about this machine and how I made it, I have a four part build series, which I think you guys will find pretty interesting. That's moving some metal. One more side and we'll get this thing welded on. I gotta lift it up. Oh. Almost getting to the point where I can't lift it anymore. It's now time to work on the screw assembly to get this thing moving under its own power. As far as I can tell about the screw in the photo, it looks like there's a nut welded approximately here, which I think we can do. The diameter of the screw, hard to tell. So I'm gonna use this one inch five Acme thread. I'm gonna have to torch or drill some holes for this to go through, possibly put a sleeve or a bushing in here because this is now doubled wall tubing. Find the corresponding spot on the opposite side, torch the hole in here, and then stick it out the back on the other side. For video sake, I think it's nicer to see what would happen if you didn't have pre-planning or a CAD drawing. So let's drill some holes in all this stuff and hopefully it all works out. So I could easily drill a one inch hole on this side of the arm and the other and slip this screw right through here. But what's gonna happen is when I start turning that handle and I start pushing on this, it's gonna wanna squish these two pieces of material together and not actually transfer the force into the jaws. So that's what this bushing that I just made on the lathe is going to do, is not allow these two pieces to squish. But we can't tell that that's in the picture or not. I'm gonna assume it's there. You're probably used to seeing this style of hole saw, which uses a bimetal teeth. This is the carbide. Voila. Virtually cut anything with this. They're way more expensive, but they're a lot nicer to use. This is what I'm gonna use to drill through each piece of material. These will easily drill up to one inch thick plate because of their depth. Carbide teeth, just like on a uh, machinist tool or a table saw blade, so they cut pretty nice. And they're really nice to have if you do a lot of metal working and you're not confident cutting a circular hole with a torch. So let's use this. We're gonna chuck it into the drill and off we go. Okay, I'm gonna cheat. I've shown you guys you can drill the hole with a hand drill. So let's go over to the radial drill and drill this. It's gonna be much faster doing it that way. I'm using the radial drill because it's designed for this exact purpose. Weldments or things that have already been assembled that need holes drilled in them. It has a big table, the head can move over to the side and you can punch or drill holes or even drill and tap. This radial drill is a baby with its three foot arm. Some of these drills have arms up to 12, 15 feet long. Mr. Logan's design with everything welded doesn't give you any room for error. Everything has to be perfectly concentric and true and straight. If it was me and my design, I would have made the nut a floating nut. If your screw is a little bit bent or the holes aren't quite aligned right, it could take up the variances in the components. It looks like in the photo, Mr. Logan added a protector or a shield for the screw that hangs out the back. And I'm just using a piece of DOM tubing to make it match his picture. I'm guessing if a log or something rolls off the back of the vise, this piece of tubing should protect that. I got the jaws on, got everything welded, all blended, and it looks just like the picture. But there's something that I noticed when I installed everything together, and I was worried about this when I saw the photo. So this is its max opening, basically teeter-totters <laughs> on that front foot. Can you imagine putting something heavy in here like a log and trying to pound? It's just not balanced. Probably had it bolted down in the back. I'm gonna take inspiration from this hand truck and add a piece of plate steel, much like the hand truck has, to the front. This is gonna allow us to stand on it. It's not gonna get in our way. We can bevel the edges and not trip over it. So let's get that done and solved. Unfortunately, this is where I deviate from Mr. Logan's plans, but it's kind of necessary to make this vice usable. So this is what I came up with, this piece of 316th 
plate steel to help keep it stable. But what I'm finding out is I tried it really long, too springy, still kind of wants to bounce around. A little bit short, seems like it's a good compromise between rigidity and tipping. You're probably gonna say, Jason, just weld some legs out here, rigid pieces. And I would agree that would fix the problem, but then you're gonna be stubbing your foot into it, kind of like these are sticking out. These are tripping hazards. So trying to remove as many tripping hazards as possible. Yeah, I could put a big, huge one inch piece of plate steel back here. I could also put 400 pounds of counterbalance on the back of this thing to get it to stay in place too. But the art of this design is how do you get it rigid enough and stable enough and reduce the tripping hazards. So I'm gonna put this little shark fin in here. It's gonna stiffen up the plate, keep it from bending. You shouldn't really be touching this with your toes because it's gonna be in the center. But this is the best solution I can come up with that looks good and functions adequately. It's now time to work on the hand wheel. When I look at the original Logan Vice, it looks like a cast wheel with some S-curved spokes. We're gonna have to make one. I need to create a ring for your hand at approximately 12 inches in diameter, then come up with some way to make the S-curved spokes, and then a hub to attach to the screw. So I would like to make the wheel out of this one inch thick piece of plate steel. I have enough space on here to cut a one huge continuous ring, probably around 12 inches in diameter. And I'm gonna do it by using this a torch attachment. I have two different torch styles here. One is a designated cutting torch, but my torch attachment doesn't fit my torch. This end slips over the cutting nozzle and then this side kind of wedges there. But as you can see, it hits my trigger of my cutting torch. So this thing does not fit. So I'm gonna have to switch to this cutting torch. This is a combination torch and this cutting attachment just clicks right on just like that. This attachment has a point. This will sit into a center punch. From this distance to the nozzle is gonna be our radii or the radius of our circle. And we can set that anywhere with this little knob. Cut small circles, big circles, arches, and then we lock it down. So let me show you how we use it and we'll slice some parts out with it. I'm gonna set this point and just the outside of that kerf to six inches. And that's the beauty is I can make it whatever I want. So even if I'm off, I'm right. So the order goes, we cut the outside and then we do the inside. Because if we do the inside, this hole drops out and then we lose our center. The goal for me for these popular mechanics builds is to show you different solutions to the problem. I could easily have cut this ring out with a water jet, but the torch works just as good. With a cutting torch and a turntable, you can make just about anything. You can make a turntable with a wheel caster and a piece of plate steel, and this cutting torch attachment is like $75 not that expensive at all. The wheel's looking great, but it's not profiled to fit my hand. So I wanna use the grinder and profile it like this. This is turning out pretty good with the grinder, but nobody wants to watch grinding. I don't wanna discourage you guys from making wheels with simple hand tools, but I do have a lathe here, so I'm gonna use that to make the contour and bevel the edges. So let's take this to the lathe and make this look really nice. Knowing that I was gonna use the lathe, I made the blank a little bit oversized so I could cut off all that dross and make the wheel round and to size. Instead of giving all the corners a fillet, I'm choosing to do a chamfer. The chamfer is gonna make it look like a cast draft angle and that's kind of the look I'm going for. Yes, I'm using an orbital wood sander on steel and it works pretty good for removing burrs, putting a nice finish on it and blending any rough edges. So let's work on getting some spokes installed. So here's my inspiration for making these cool S spokes. This is a half inch diameter hot rolled steel bar. And I'm just gonna be bending them between two posts and kind of a shape that I think that looks good. We really don't have any fancy measurements to go off of. We're just gonna make five identical parts. And I'm just gonna use this little extension bar and just bend it into shape. You can't be wrong, even if they're not identical, it's gonna give it that handmade feel. And then I just match up to my little template here. Now let's go flip it around and do the other side. And you can make this look like anything you want. And then what we look at is part of the section. This is the one I bent, earlier one. Looks pretty close. Make a mark. And we cut the tails off in the bandsaw. That's looking cool. We'll have to adjust the length once we get their hub made. So all I need now is a center hub that's gonna to attach to the screw and hold the spokes. I'm using two and a half solid bar stock with a one inch through hole. The hole just needs to fit whatever diameter screw you decide to use. I need a really simple weld fixture to get the spokes just in the right place. I gotta get this hub in the center of the square, so I'm using the pin. And once I know that's perfect, 
Then I can use the flat edges of the plate to center the ring. Then I can use some fireball shims to elevate the spoke in the center of the wheel. And then I just use my calibrated eyeball to position the spokes where I think it looks good. Look at how cool this wheel's turned out. I like that. Even though every one of those spokes are completely different and hand bent, you cannot tell that they're not, I don't know, perfect. But we're missing one more component and that is a speed handle. And I'm going to use this one off the shelf because I like the shape, I think it fits the curvature. And then you can easily make one of these. Everything down to the simplest of form to where the piece of DOM tubing slipped over a bolt or a socket headed cap screw. But in order to fasten this to the wheel, we're gonna have to drill and tap into the face to get this mounted. So let's go do that next. I wanted this handle to look like it was growing right out of the end of the spoke, so I saved its positioning for the very last thing. So let's talk a little bit on how I want to get this wheel attached to this Acme thread. The simplest way to do it is just to weld it to the hub, just something like that. We could weld it, plug weld it, grind it smooth, you'd never know. I'm not a real big fan of welding something into place that could wear out over time. So my idea is to take the Acme nut, thread it onto the end of the shaft, and then what we'll do is we'll cross pin it. I will drill through the nut and into the shaft and we'll use a roll pin and that way it's secured and then I will weld or tack weld the nut to the hub. And that way you could get a wrench on here if you wanted to or replace the thread at any time. Just in case you guys wanna build your own vise but don't wanna build your own hand wheel, I recommend this one. It's cast iron, it's chrome plated, it's heavy, it looks good, has the speed handle on it, has the correct size bore that you need. I'll leave a link in the description below where you guys can find it. But for my hand wheel, I want an oil rubbed bronze look. So first thing you need to do is get the wheel up to temperature, super hot, and then rub some linseed oil and wax on it. It'll give it this cool oil rubbed bronze look. Now the only thing left to do is paint it, get it cleaned up, and then we can put it onto the probe, see how powerful it is, and see where the weak spot is. Then maybe we can compare it to the big floor vise here in the shop. So let's test it out. So what do you guys think? Got our oil rub bronze wheel. We got this thing all painted red. It's looking kind of classy. I didn't know what color to paint it because obviously the photo is black and white. I'm just kind of a red guy, as you can tell about all the other things I make. How does it feel? It feels pretty good. I had to grind off some paint where it was causing some binding issues. The wheel feels about right in diameter. As I'm standing here, I can reach the top of the hand wheel at any point and open the vise. If the handle is hanging down, look how far I'd have to reach to grab it. I'm literally bent all the way over. And then you're doing this rowing motion to get it to go. And then when you let go, the handle falls, and then you gotta reach for it again. But the wheel is much nicer. You can reach it while standing. The speed handle is definitely necessary. Another thing I noticed is don't expect this thing to be a precision instrument. The jaws are curved because this is just plate steel. Don't expect this two big surfaces to match perfectly. We're basically just holding wood here, so I really don't think it matters. Before we put a log in here, I'd like to address some problems that I can see and that I kind of anticipated. For one, when we get this thing all the way out, it is still very tipsy. And two, I think this thing has to be bolted down. It wants to move around on you. This thing only weighs like 300 pounds, so it's really easy to pivot or move. I can see this being a problem if you're trying to chisel or hammer on something. It just does not have the mass to be able to hold your work securely. So I'm thinking Mr. Logan had this bolted down in the back. That's probably why he didn't need this front foot. Compared to the big gigantic blacksmith vise, this sucker is basically unmovable. And everybody made fun of me for making it too heavy and why do you need a vise this big? This is an unmovable object and I like to move the furniture around so I don't want to bolt things to the floor. You're going to have to add another thousand pounds to this thing to get it to be usable without bolting it. But enough talking, blah, blah, blah. Let's put something in the jaws and see how it clamps. Let's clamp this rotten log to see how well it holds. Oh, it's pretty good. Okay, maybe not. Let's try this again. I think I was right on a knot. Boy, this thing just bounces around all over the place. Okay, I hear some wood cracking. I think it's adequate clamping force. What I think should be an appropriate clamping force is probably somewhere between the two to 4,000 pound clamping force range for wood. So I used a five threads per inch screw. This is a great thread pitch for speed versus clamping force. 
You start going too fine, it's gonna take you forever to move the jaw. You start going too coarse, you're going to lose a lot of force. So the five, I think, is a really good balance of the two. So I'm using my test probe here. I'm gonna just try with the jaws closed at first. See if we can't bend it. Oh, there's a 1,000, 1,500. 2,200 pounds. Let's see if it still operates. Yes. I'm just gonna go to where I feel comfortable. Let's try it one more time. And remember, this is approximately almost 14 inches. Pretty decent size opening. 1,600, 3,000. That's exactly what I was expecting from this thing. For woodworking, this is perfectly adequate. I don't think you'd want any more than that. Yeah, my biggest complaint is that woodworking, you're probably gonna get this screw all gummed up with sawdust. So I don't know if that's a really good idea. I can see that being a potential problem. Things that I like about it, how compact from the dynamic jaw to the end of the wheel, where if you look at my vise, the blacksmith vise, you have quite a far distance away. But when you compare these two machines, they are not even in the same ballpark. This thing is so smooth, so powerful. It is on a totally different playing field. With the thrust bearings and the screw, that is so much smoother. You could add them to this one, but I'm assuming that Mr. Logan did not, but it is an upgrade. But I think if you start increasing the pressure, you're gonna start bending something. So it's probably not a good idea to add that. That was pretty fun to see Mr. Logan's vice jump off the pages and become a reality and be able to build something like this right here in my machine shop. I learned a lot of things along the way and hopefully you guys did too. If you would like to build your own Logan vice, I'm gonna leave the plans down below linked to the Fireball Tool website so you can build this yourself. But overall, this was fun. I hope you guys enjoyed this. Thank you for watching and I'll see you on the next one.